Father, we, uh, we do look forward tonight, Lord, to what you have for us. And I ask that, God, as we, as we just watch a side of you that, that I think, Lord, is so often ignored and, and put aside. And, and I think a lot of people even pretend this part of you doesn't even exist. But God, I pray that we would learn that you're not a God who's just uh, one-sided, you're many-faceted, you have, you have all kinds of, of uh, attributes. And Lord, I pray tonight as we see some, some confrontation coming out and the idea of standing for what's right and standing for what's true, I, I pray that it would influence us in our own walks with you Lord, that we would be men and women who are able to say no to certain things that are going to train wreck us and mess us up and get us in a place, God, where we're, we're not where we need to be. And I pray we would be men and women who would, would take a stand for righteousness and truth. So bless this time and give us ears to hear and, and hearts that are soft and pliable that you would mold, that you would shape. And God, that you would have your way with us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Jesus now is going to, like, really, things are really going to change. He's, he's kind of been having an interaction with the Pharisees. And we've seen a little bit of confrontation. Now it's going to get very, very confrontational. They have brought Jesus, I think, to the point where he's got to demonstrate to them who he is and his authority, so he's gonna bring all of that out, and, and you know what amazes me is the way these guys have pushed and pushed and pushed, and it it's always sort of blows my mind. People push and push and push, and then when you finally push back, they get a little freaked out. And it's like, why did you push me so far? You know, if you didn't do that, I wouldn't push back. But Jesus obviously is gonna do it under great self-control, and, and he's not gonna blow it like some of us, and I'm thinking of myself, blow it and get into things. But the interesting thing here is that he's doing this publicly. Remember, remember where he's at, and we got to keep in mind in this, in this whole section, he's still in that temple area, and they came at him publicly, so he's going to rebuke them publicly. You know, sometimes people say, you know, well, you can't bring that up, or you can't say that out loud, or you can't say that, you know, publicly about people. Hey, I think if they, if they come at you that way, you got to answer them that way. So Jesus is going to stand up, he's going to answer them, he's going to talk to them and bottom line he's going to call them out as false teachers and you know the the word warns us that that uh, you know throughout the ages we're going to have until the end and here's a few passages you can read that we're going to have false teachers those who are going to bring or either add to the word or take away from the word and they're going to come at us and we're warned and it's, it was going on hey it's been going on since the fall if you read the prophets, what are the prophets all about? What did Moses do? What did even Abraham do? And here Jesus is doing it. And I think we still do it in our day, man. If you're going to stand on truth, you're, if you're standing on truth, you're going to offend some people. And as I've often said, hopefully it's the truth that offends and not us. Because sometimes we can be very offensive the way we bring it. So listen, man, Jesus is coming at these guys. And I think... I, I kind of think some of this is comical. I'm not sure the Pharisees did, but I kind of do. So look at verse one. It says, then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So first of all, in the beginning of this chapter, he's not talking to the Pharisees yet. They're there. I'm sure they're listening. I'm sure they know what he's saying. But right now, he's addressing those that the Pharisees are influencing and those that the Pharisees have influenced, and he's letting them know, hey, man, something is really, really wrong. So we need to, the multitudes and the disciples. So uh, again, I get the idea that it's pretty crowded, that it wasn't just a couple people showing up and it wasn't off in some corner, you know, in a temple area and they're hid away and they're tucked away. But I think they're right out in the open and he's bringing this up. And then listen, then he says uh, that, that the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, the the King James, I'm sorry, the New American Standard says it this way, and I think that's what's implied here. It says the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. 
They didn't have that authority. We've talked about the Pharisees before and where they come, came from. Remember, there wasn't, quote, always the sect of Pharisees. Basically, it, it was a progression as the people were in Babylon, and we, we discussed that a little bit, and we discussed it on, on Thursday nights. As they were in Babylon, they could no longer worship at the temple. Duh, there was no temple. So they, that's where the synagogue movement started and where they began to come together and meet in groups and you might call them home groups, but then they built them a little bit bigger. And from the synagogues, then they began to get teachers in the synagogues that, that, that would proclaim. And then out of that came this whole idea of Pharisees. And there's several different sects. And I know usually when we hear the word Pharisee, and, and sometimes we even call people, right? If, you, if the person's being real legalistic and creepy, you kind of say, you Pharisee you know and and we need to know something they they didn't start out bad they started out good and I brought that up a lot they started out really good and there were good Pharisees during the time of Christ hey Nicodemus was a Pharisee Joseph of Arimathea was a Pharisee now but there were, there were all kinds, of, and, then, and then I just read this recently, there were a whole bunch of different sects of Pharisees, and I don't want to get into all that and get trapped into, you know, just doing this long study on those guys because we'll get mixed up. But also the scribes, the scribes were part of the Pharisees, and something you need to know, we're studying on Thursday night, we're studying Ezra, Ezra was a scribe. And he was a good guy. So don't always think these guys are always negative. Now, most of them were. And they brought, hey, they brought a bunch of legalism and they hassled the people. And, oh, well, we're going to see. So Jesus said, listen, they're sitting in the seat in the chair of Moses. Now, it's not, listen, it wasn't a chair that they went and sat in. It was, they were trying to take that position of authority. Today in universities, when a professor is the head of a department, what do they usually call him? The chair, right? And he's not a chair. Obviously, he's a person, but they say the chair. So it's a person of authority, and here's what these guys did. They usurped that authority of Moses, and now they're coming, listen, they're coming and they're usurping that authority, and yeah, they have the word of God, but many of the Pharisees added a whole bunch. We've talked about it. Hey, they added a ton. The Talmud, the Talmud was 50 volumes, like, I think it's hard enough to remember 613 laws, but 50 volumes? That's a whole bunch to try and obey, right? So they're doing all of that. So listen, man, Jesus is saying, hey, you guys, you guys, you need to know something. He says, he says I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, the scribes and the Pharisees who sit in Moses' seat. Verse 3, therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, and do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. So the first off, Jesus now is telling them, hey, when they bring up the word, you're supposed to obey the word. You know, even a donkey can bring the word, Right? And so if a donkey brings the word, you need to listen. And, and that's what he's saying. Now, they added to the word, and he's definitely not wanting them to follow that and go into that. But hey, when they tell you something that's in the word, here's the problem. Sometimes there's, there's false teachers in our day. And some false teachers, uh, I don't know about you guys, I, I used to listen to a whole bunch. I don't so much anymore because I get mad and break TVs and it's expensive and, you know, it drives me crazy. But, but early on in my Christian life, man, there was, a, and I'm not going to say who it was, there was a complete heretical false teacher on TV, but he said something that touched my heart because it was the word of God. He's reading out of Romans chapter 14 and it went zing, man, right in my heart and made me deal with something in my life. So here's what Jesus is saying. Hey, if they bring something, you can't just say, hey, just because they're, they're, they're Pharisees or heretics or whatever we want to say, you don't just throw everything they say. He goes, hey, when they say good things, you observe that and you do that thing. But their problem was these guys were those kind of people and we have them and you see them. They're the kind of people who tell you what to do, but they don't do it, right? They're the kind of people, hey, you need to go do this, you know, and if you're not doing that, then something's really, 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 really wrong with you. And they put these trips on you and they act all holy, but if you watch them, they're never doing anything. I remember in the workplace. It used to drive me crazy when you're in the workplace and you have those people that are always just, they're busy as they can be, 
but they never get anything done. You know what I'm talking about? And you just go, because you're kind of carrying the load, right? And you're working with them and you're watching them and you're going, how could you be that busy and do nothing? That's what the Pharisees are all about, right? It's a perfect picture. They're just like, and they're doing all this stuff and they have all the robes and have all this stuff on, but they're not doing, listen, Jesus says, they're not doing anything. You need to be careful with them and you need to watch out. So do, do the things you're supposed to and don't throw it out just because they said it. But listen, man, hey, these guys don't do what they're supposed to do. Their words prove who they are. And something I think we need to realize Watch a person's life. See what their life is like. And if their life's chaotic and messed up and stuff, I probably wouldn't go to them for a lot of counsel and a lot of advice of going on. Watch people. So, so you know, Jesus' bottom line is saying that. And then he says in verse 4, for they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not and will not move them with one finger. In other words, they're not going to lift a finger to help you. They're not going to do anything. And, and again, culturally, they get it. We don't, we don't like have animals of burden anymore, like donkeys and camels. And, and uh, I remember in Mexico when, when we would use donkeys, when we would hike into that one village. Hey, you got to load a donkey right. You don't just like load it all on one side or, you know, a mule or a horse. You gotta, you're careful how you put it on an animal and so they can carry it right, so they can get the, you know, whatever you have from point A to point B, and you're careful about it. Here's what Jesus is saying. These guys just throw a burden on you, man. They don't care how it's on you. They're careless about it, and they weight you down. And, you know, I think one of the worst things in Christianity is having people put so many trips on you and so many burdens on you, you just feel so pushed down when I was at when I was in my legalistic younger years in Christianity I would listen to these guys man and these guys I remember one in particular and I'm gonna not gonna name him because some of you may like him but I, I remember I remember here's what he said he says how could you expect the Holy Spirit to come in your life if you're not holy because he's the Holy Spirit and he's just like and then he said all these things and I thought well, I could never be that. Do you guys still sin? Yeah. And I remember listening to that and thinking, well, then I guess I'll never have the Holy Spirit because, hey, I want to be holy. I want to do right. But we all know what we do. And, hey, they, and I used to listen to these guys and they'd put all these burdens, man, and it would get heavier and heavier and, and then I would try and do it and then I would get legalistic and then I would think I'm going to heaven. I wasn't sure about anybody else. I maybe, maybe Gaynell, but I wasn't real sure for her and, and uh, you know, and, and it was just like, I, but I knew I was gonna be fine. And man, it's bad when you get that way and then you try and carry those burdens and then pretty soon here's what happens. You collapse can't do it. And that's why a lot of people, I believe, walk away from Christianity. Because they have all of these burdens laid upon them. And then I remember I would listen to these guys, and this was back when you had cassette tapes, younger generation, Google that. And I, I, I think I've shared before, I used, to, I used to mail, there was no Christian radio or anything other than Bisbee, there was none of that. And uh, there was heresy on TV, but I remember I used to get tapes and send them back and forth with this tape ministry in Tucson. And, and, you know, and, then, and then I would listen to these guys and I'd get all burdened down and weighted down. And then I would put on Chuck Smith. And it would be grace. And I'd go, oh, this feels so good. And then I would go back and listen to those. I don't know why I did that. Like I'd get all like, oh. And then I'd go back and listen to those guys for a while. And then I'd go, oh. And I finally got, I'm, I'm a little slow, I'm dense. So I finally got to the place like, why don't I stay in the awe zone, right? And then I went through the whole Bible with Chuck. And that's how, you know, I found Calvary Chapel and found the, the whole ministry. But man, they lay burdens on you. And he says, be careful. Listen, listen to what the Lord said through Ezekiel. We just finished studying Ezekiel on, on Thursday nights. But listen to what he says in Ezekiel 34. Talking about that same time, that stuff going on. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. 
prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and you clothe yourself with the wool and you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound the broken, nor brought back that which was driven away, nor sought that which was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Man, that's what happens when we don't give people the true word of God and listen, man, then we're not there. Hey, we're there to, I, I feel my whole, my whole job, if you will, is to get people to fall more in love with Jesus and, and get more of Jesus in their life. My job is not to make you holy. That's the Holy Spirit's problem. Major problem for some of you. But listen, man, that's, that's what, I'm not to do that. I'm just, I'm, to, I'm there. I want to I wanna strengthen you. I want to bind it up and I want us to go and I want us to go forward. And I don't want to put burdens on people's backs. I want to take burdens off of people and lift those. Jesus said, most of us have this memorized, right? Jesus in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We're familiar with that, right? Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light and man listen he's telling these guys watch out these pharisees man these guys they're putting all of this stuff on you and they don't even want to help you oh and then in verse five but all their works now he's going to get into the the, to the nitty-gritty of the thing all their works they do by uh, they all their works they do to be seen by men that they may make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments so here's what he's saying man everything and and you you see it all the time. Religious people, they do things for a show. And it's sort of show and tell. And it's look how religious I am. Now, Numbers 15, here's the crazy thing. Numbers 15, God told them to put tassels and, 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 and these things on their garments. And here's what God says, man, I want you to do these things so you can remember who you are and remember who I am. And so they would take that very simple thing that God said to do. And they started making them bigger and broader and, and, and crazier and tricking them out. Hey, when I was in the Philippines, I got enamored. They have these, these uh, jeepneys, they call them. They're like old Willis jeeps and they, they trick them out. And I think, you know, I just think they should have a parade. I think they should have a contest. But anyway, anyway, I just was enamored with the way these guys would trick out these funky, funky little taxi cars. And, but that's what the Pharisees would do. They'd trick out their robes and they'd go, well, look at me, how nice I am. And they'd make them look holy. And then, and then listen, he says in their phylacteries, instead of doing just the GoPro type box, the small one, they, they started making them big like they had a house on their head. And they're walking around and they're going, and this is how holy I am. And hey, remember, remember we talked about the four scriptures. God told them, put these scriptures. Here's what God says. Put these scriptures in your mind, on your heart, and on your hands and do them. He didn't say make boxes, shove paper in there, and tie it on your wrist and tie it on your head. But they were getting bigger and bigger. And here's what Jesus said. These guys do everything they do for show. It's not their heart. They're doing it for show. And they want everybody to watch them and they want everybody to go, ooh, you are so holy. And it's almost sickening, isn't it, as believers when you see people doing that and you're going, yuck, why do you do that? And I believe, listen, I believe in Christianity there's a lot of different, a lot of different ways people exhibit some of these same things and no, they're not doing big tassels and they're not putting boxes on their heads, but they're doing things and, and hey, you start seeing it and it's for show. Sometimes it's a big show about how the Holy Spirit moves and, and it's a big dog and pony show and everybody's going, whoa, look at all of that. And you're going, that doesn't seem right. There was a, an evangelist, Benny Hinn, was in Israel. The guide that we use often, Ronnie Simone, was a guide for his 
entourage. It, he had 20 buses. It's a lot of people. And Ronnie was his guide, and I said, why? Why would you be his guide? And he goes, because it looks good on my resume. Now, I understand what Ronnie's doing. That was his, uh, hey, that was his job. He wants to, he's building a resume. And I said, but really? And here's what happened. Ronnie Simone had a son who had a, a, a deformity in his leg and his ankle. And it's pretty severe. And Benny Hinn said, if you bring your son to the soccer stadium, I will heal him. And Ronnie said, come to my house and pray for my son. And Benny wouldn't do it because it wasn't a big dog and pony show. You, you get what I'm talking about? Now, to me, the good news in that was Ronnie obviously saw through what was going on. And then even some better news is a bunch of the Calvary chapels got together, paid for Ronnie's son to come to the States to get the surgery he needed so his son would be healed. And hey, that's what it's all about, right? Hey, don't do things so men see what you're doing and, and they go, ooh, you're so awesome. Listen, I love teaching the Bible and I wanna teach a Bible, but I don't teach a Bible so people will go, oh, you're so awesome. My, my prayer, my heart is, after I get done, you will say, God is awesome. And God is good. So listen, man, he says, you gotta be aware. Because, hey, we all, we all, we all have egos, right? Nod your heads. Even if you don't think you do, you do. Yeah, we all have that thing. And, and, we, and, and man, that's the flesh. And if it gets fed. So listen, man, he says, watch that. And then he says, verse 6, they love the best places at feasts and the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace. And, and they love to be called rabbi, rabbi. Now, now, now listen, now, now he's kind of getting into some pretty heavy stuff. Hey, the Pharisees, the Pharisees were not servants. In my Bible, it says we're called to be servants. And we'll get to that here at the end of the study. But, but listen, man, these guys, these guys wanted to be seen. They wanted to have special privileges. Do you know who I, and it always bugs me when, when, when well, when, you, when you're out in, in the world and you see some, quote, religious person trying to get special favor because of who they are. It's like, why are you doing that? This is weird. And they want the better seats and they wanted to be treated and they wanted to be called by special names. Now, now listen, rabbi, we kind of think of rabbi as teacher, but rabbi meant more like supreme one or great one or most excellent one. And he goes, that's what they wanted to be called. That was their motivation. Listen, they were doing what they were doing out of a heart that I want, I want people to recognize. And, hey, and it's a fine line. I think we all walk. We all walk that line. If you're serving Jesus and somebody says something nice to you, be careful. Now listen, I'm not saying, uh, it was funny, after last week someone went out and like, because we talked about flattery last week and someone went out and went, oh, Pastor Pat, you're so awesome, you're so great. I punched them but because, because they were being silly. But, but listen, it's okay. it's okay to tell somebody they're doing a good job. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have to be careful when somebody tells us we're doing a good job that that's not all of a sudden become the motive for why we're doing what we're doing. And one way, listen, one way to really check your heart in this, this is a good, just a practical application for this. If you're ever in the place where you're serving and you look around and you think, where are all the other people? How come I'm the only one doing this? You've just crossed that line. And we've just gone to the place where now you think you're somebody special because you're doing it and others aren't. Do you know not everybody's called to what you're doing? I know that's a hard one, man. It takes a while to figure that out. Not everybody's called to do the ministry you're called to. Not everybody's called to talk the way you talk or do whatever you do. And you have to be careful when you're doing that. And you'd, hey, you surely don't want to be one of these guys. And then you got to, listen, man, if you're doing something for a title, well, if you're in Calvary Chapel and you're doing something for a title, you're just messed up because it ain't going to happen. You know, and, and hey, if that's your goal, it's funny, you know, I, I, I warn the young, young people, hey man, if your goal is to get pastor in front of your name or something, be careful. Why are you doing that? You know, and, and uh, even that, you know, he's, well, look at what he talks about here. Look at the next thing he talks about. He says, 
He says, but you do not, but you do not be called rabbi or, you know, most excellent one. And then he says, for one is your teacher. So he kind of translated it that way. For one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not uh, call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father, he is in heaven. And do not be called teachers or instructors or masters. For one is your teacher, master, uh, instructor, the Christ. Now, listen, Jesus is not here putting aside all of this stuff in church and, and offices in the church and hey the Bible explicitly tells us he raises some up to be apostles some to be prophets some to be pastors and teachers some to be evangelists so listen he's not saying you don't do any of that but here's what he's saying you be careful that you're not doing what you're doing for a title and that you want somebody to call you something you know it always bothers me when somebody and and it is sort of interesting if you do a, 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 a etymology study on this whole rabbi thing and and then how it was translated into latin and and etc it, it all boils down and kind, kind of comes out the other side in our generation to people who get doctorates. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting a doctorate. I think that's great. If you can do that much brain power, God bless you. But the problem becomes when you want to be called doctor. Oh, I'm doctor so-and-so. And now you want a title. And if you're doing what you're doing in the body of Christ for a title, shame on you. Once again, he's not saying we shouldn't respect people in serving in different areas he's not he's not putting that down he's just saying be careful and, and when he talks about listen again that whole idea of rabbi or teacher or whatever and then he says listen the whole father you only have one spiritual father now there's nothing wrong with calling your dad dad he's not saying you do away with a biological part or even hey if somebody was special to you in your spiritual life and you look up to them that way, that's okay to show them some respect. But you only have one who gave you birth spiritually, and that's God. And we just have to be careful of that. So, oh, by the way, I have to say this because I kind of I get, you know, I get a lot of flack that I'm anti-Catholic. And people get uptight with me, and that's okay if you do, it's all right. But, uh, uh, you know, I'll stand up for the Catholics here. This verse 9 is not telling Catholics not to call priests fathers. So if you're somebody you're going to go thump on Catholics, don't use this verse to thump on them because you're taking it out of context, and that's not what he's talking about. So now, now the rest of you will send me bad news about, you know, taking sides with Catholics and, and you'll be all bent out of shape, which is good. It's good to keep people riled up. That's what, that's what I like to do. But this, this verse is not for that. Now, I do, I do have issues with that, but that's a whole different time. So listen here. He's saying, be careful. And, and some people say, you know, well, well, don't you take that title, pastor? Well, I take that title because I am a shepherd. And the whole idea of pastor the etymology of that is that you're a servant. Listen, I believe my gift is teaching the Bible. And that's how I serve the body of Christ. And I'm going to pour all of myself into that to serve the body so that I can elevate others to be what they're called to be. The problem with the Pharisees and what they were doing is they want to crawl over people to get where they're going. A true servant of the Lord wants to be the ladder for others to get up higher than they are. And that's what Jesus is telling us. Watch out what you're doing here and be careful and be that person. Listen to what, listen to what Albert Einstein wrote. I, this is kind of blows my mind that I'm quoting him but listen to what he said he says to become a man of success he says try not to become a man of success but rather try to become a man of value wow well that's a pretty good quote huh hey be somebody who's valuable and what's going on and then you know what's going to happen you're going to be very successful because you're valuable and you're an asset to whatever's happening. Hey, when people serve here at Calvary, we want them to be an ad, we want them to be somebody who's valuable. And when they be, when they when they understand, I'm going to work and be valuable. Then they become a real asset for the ministry and what's going on. And the ministry grows and and people are changed. So so listen, man. Jesus lays all of that out. Now here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking there's some people by him, like grinding their teeth right now. Oh, it's going to get worse. But I think right now they're thinking, I just want to shoot this guy. Well, I guess they didn't shoot people, but you know what I mean. 
Can't believe he's saying that stuff. And I believe, listen, I believe the disciples are going, wow. Remember the culture, remember what's going on. Hey, these Pharisees and scribes, they've been running stuff for a long time. They've been in charge. And that's something that breaks my heart when I see people trapped in a system because that's all they know. And I believe, listen, I believe we have an obligation to teach people and to free them from systems that have trapped them. Hey, right now we're all about, there's a huge movement within Christianity and out of Christianity to stop this whole sex trade thing going on and human trafficking. And and I think, man, listen, I think we need to be about that. And I think that's horrible. But I also think it's horrible when people are trapped in systems that are just pushing them down and sucking all of the spiritual life out of them. And that's all these guys. So think about the disciples, man. This is brand new information. We're used to it and some of us are going, man, we know all this, why are you spending time on this? Some of us may not. But think about, think about how it was affecting those guys. Just, just the 12, they had to be going, wow. All their lives, they looked up to those guys with the long tassels and the big boxes on their head. And they always thought they were so spiritual and so great and now along comes this guy who's just blowing all of that out of the water and saying, man, you need to understand, those guys are ripping you off. Hey, he wasn't doing it because he didn't like those guys. He did it because he loved the disciples. So not only them, but the multitude, it had to get a little bit tense by, uh, by the temple that day on that Temple Mount area. Oh, and then he says, listen, he says the one, the one that a lot of us are, are extremely familiar with, he said this before, verse 11, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Yeah. We're to be servants. You know, one of my favorite passages, John chapter 13, right? Most of us know that. Remember they go into the room? We're gonna, we're gonna, go into that room in Matthew, but we're not gonna do the John thing because that's special to John. But remember John recorded it, they went in a room and everybody sat down to eat and Jesus got up and got the basin and got the towel. The thing that blows my mind about that is everybody knew, listen, everybody in that room, read it for homework, read the whole passage, don't just, don't just read part of it, read the whole passage because every man in that room knew one thing the lowest servant picks up the basin and the towel. And every one of them walked by that and said, I'm not doing that. I ain't gonna do that. These are the good guys, right? As one says, these were the apostles, not the B-apostles. I mean, these are the ones Jesus chose. And they all walk by it and go, "Ah." I think they all thought the one guy, right? Thaddeus, nobody remembers his name. You're the one that nobody remembers. You get it, man. Hey, we all know Peter. We know John. We know James. We know Matthew. Hey, one of you, one of you lower apostles, you get it. And nobody picked that up. And that always blows my mind. Can you imagine how uncomfortable it was when Jesus got up and grabbed that man? <laughs> they all go, I bet they scrambled for a little. No, 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 no. Let me do this. And he goes, too late, bros. I got this. And obviously he was demonstrating some. He wasn't telling us we need to do foot washings. Cracks me up. Churches that do that announce it beforehand so everybody can powder their feet and come all clean. I think you should do foot washings like at the most inopportune time. Like July. Right? People are wearing flip-flops and their feet are funky. I sold shoes for a while. I know funky feet, man. If you ever, hey, if you've ever measured like an a, a eight-year-old's foot after he's been in school all day, you know foot funky. Man, it is nasty. So listen, that's when we should do it. But, but Jesus says we gotta be servants. 
Yeah, if you want to be exalted, become a servant and become the last and humble yourself. That's what he exampled to us. That's what he said. Listen to what Peter wrote in his letter. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter. He says to the, to the pastors, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but, be, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Don't you love that? And that's Pete, man, and it took him a while to learn that. So Jesus now now imagine, man, imagine now at that moment, man, the disciples are trying to process this. The multitudes are trying to process this. I think everybody has a look of wonderment on their face. And the, and the, the, the Pharisees are like growling, right? They're like, you got to know they were freaked out. Hey, when you start upsetting somebody's religious apple cart, they get real uptight real fast. So we're going to stop here, then we're going to read next week the woes. Then it's going to get hot and heavy. So you got to come back. Right? I'm hanging you out there, so you have to come back and find out what's going on. You can read ahead. But man, I don't know about you guys, but I read this section in Matthew, and I, here's what I think. Man, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, number one, everybody on that Temple Mount, was influenced by what he just said. Some are in awe. Some are in wonder. Some are thinking, wow, I've just been set free. I've just been set free. Hey, if you've ever been bound up in legalism and you get set free from that, there's nothing better. And you generally don't go back unless you're brain dead. But you don't want to go back to that if you've been bound up in it. And there's nothing better. And I can imagine some of these people of the multitudes are going, yes. And I believe, man, they started shouting it from the rooftops. And it got pretty tense in those days right before they arrested him and killed him. Let's stand up and pray. Jesus, as we think about this and look at this, we thank you, God, for the challenge that we have. We thank you, Lord, that, that we, can, we can read this scripture and for some of us, some of us is challenging us. I think sometimes we get mixed up in our whole, our whole walk with you and what we're doing and we start, we start seeking position, seeking recognition. Lord, we start desiring for people to see us. And God, we can get so derailed. And I pray that tonight, for some of the young people here, wanting to serve you, wanting to go further with you, that God, this would touch our hearts. And I pray for some of the rest of us, God, that would touch our hearts and we would make sure that we're doing what we're doing because we want to bring you honor and glory. That God, we would understand whether we're helping people find seats, whether we're greeting someone coming in the door, whether we're standing behind this pulpit, whether we're behind an instrument, that the things we do are all done to glorify you and to exalt the name of God and to edify the body of Christ to build others up so they can be what you've called them to be. So Lord, give us hearts that we understand we're nothing but servants. If we played and sang a song well, that's good, but it was your song. If we teach the word, that's good, but it's your word. And we need to understand that you're the one that does the work. By your Holy Spirit, you change lives. We don't change anybody. And we would hold that dear to our hearts. Now I'm gonna ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer for another couple moments here tonight.
And maybe you're here tonight and, and hey, maybe even as we talked about this, you've been coming to Calvary for quite a while. And yet as we talked about this, all of a sudden, man, in your heart, you realized, I'm not born again. I'm not saved. I'm, I'm in a system and I'm about a system. And the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart and right now, you're in that place where you know you need salvation. Maybe you just visited tonight and came in and, and God touched your heart and, and, and let you know that you need this thing we call salvation. So if he's speaking to you and drawing you, I know you're a little nervous right now and a little concerned and that's good. But Jesus is calling you into a relationship with him. And you need to make a choice right now. Do you want a relationship with him or stay where you're at? Because Jesus is offering you freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom from legalism, freedom from religion. And he's offering you this eternal life. And all you have to do is accept it. So if you wanna accept that, call on his name. The Bible says that we've all sinned. And I think we know that. I don't think that we need to go in depth on that. If you're standing here tonight, you know, you know you've sinned. And the wages of that, what you've earned from that is separation from God. That's the bad news. The good news is, as I've been saying, Jesus paid that price. Now he offers you this free gift of forgiveness of your sin and of a relationship with him. And all you have to do is take that, receive that, and you'll be set free. So if you want to do that tonight, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you say this prayer with me. You can say it out loud or you can say it silently. Volume is not what matters, but what matters is your heart. You need to be sincere. If you're backslidden tonight, hey man, come back to Jesus. Say this prayer with us. Don't be, don't be someone who you fight it and you think you're not worthy, but come home, come back. You know that's his heart. You know he wants you home. If you're watching online, you can say this prayer with us right in your home, right where you're sitting. So again, you can say it out loud or you can say it silent, but it's got to come from your heart. Jesus, tonight I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And tonight I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you tonight for your forgiveness. And right now, I want you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, I want you to come into my life and guide me. Tonight, I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. Man, if that's the 